Hey everyone, I'm Dan Sege from Hydro Ottawa, and I'll be hosting the Think Energy podcast. So here's today's big question. Are you looking to better understand the fast-changing world of energy? Join me every two weeks and get a unique perspective from industry leaders as we deep dive and discuss some of the coolest trends, emerging technologies, and latest innovations that drive the energy sector. So stay tuned as we explore some traditional and some quirky facets of this industry. This is the Think Energy Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. Today I'd like to talk to you about smog warnings, acid rain, air pollution, in other words, the early 2000s in Ontario. Coal-fired power plants have been linked to a host of damaging environmental problems, but coal also causes a lot of public health issues with links to asthma, cancer, neurological problems, and other hearts and lung illnesses. Back in 2003, 25% of electricity in Ontario came from coal plants. Did you know coal emissions were a major source of air pollution that contributed to 53 smog days in Ontario alone in 2005? That same year, my great city of Ottawa had 25. For those that may not know, smog days would be declared in the province on days when the air wasn't as safe to breathe due to the amount of toxins in the air. In 2014, Ontario was the first jurisdiction in North America to completely eliminate coal as a source of electricity production. According to Air Quality Ontario, the province phased out of coal has been considered to have achieved the most significant results of any climate change initiative in North America to date. Now, today, 94% of electricity generated in Ontario is emission-free, and those smog advisories are all but a thing of the past. There's no doubt that Ontario has been a leader in fighting climate change and investing in cleaner energy sources. By 2030, Canada will phase out traditional coal-fired electricity in the country altogether. Striving to have 90% of electricity from non-emitting sources and simultaneously cutting carbon pollution from the electricity sector by 12.8 million tons. So here's today's big question. Although it wasn't that long ago that coal made up a quarter of Ontario's electricity supply, I feel the story of how it was achieved has been lost somehow. So how did Ontario break ahead of the pact in North America to decommission coal plants and what does that mean for our future in the renewable energy space? Joining me on today's show is Gideon Foreman, Climate Change and Transportation Policy Analysis from the David Suzuki Foundation. Gideon has a Master's of Art in philosophy from McGill University and a certificate in renewable energy from the University of Toronto. He's been awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal and is a former executive director for the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Hey Gideon, thanks so much for joining us today. Perhaps you can start by telling us a bit about yourself, your background, and what keeps you passionate about your work? Uh, thanks, Dan. Yes, um, I've worked in the environmental movement for, I guess, about 20 years now. Gosh, I guess that's right, but uh, it's, been, it's been a long time. I work with the David Suzuki Foundation uh, now. For the last five years, I've worked with David Suzuki, which has been wonderful. But before that, for 10 years, 11 years, actually, I was with a group called Physicians for the Environment, a, a group of wonderful doctors across Canada using their, their credibility and their scientific smarts as doctors to um, push for stronger environmental legislation. And with the Physicians for the Environment group, we worked on issues like pesticides, trying to ban lawn and garden pesticides, primarily to protect kids' health. And we did a lot of work on the coal phase out in Ontario and ramping up renewable energy. So I have some familiarity with that. I'm not a doctor myself, uh, but I loved working with doctors. And, and it was wonderful to see the, the influence that doctors had on, uh, on the environmental debate. 
for the last five years, since June uh, 2015, almost six years now, I've been with the Davis Suzuki Foundation, worked on a number of different things, but my major work now is around transportation, trying primarily to give people alternatives to the car. Really, that's what my work is in a nutshell. Uh, walking, cycling, public transit, these sorts of things, so they can leave the car at home and uh, move around in a more sustainable way. I have a question for you. What is coal exactly? Can you give us some background around why it was used as an energy source and why it made up such a large portion of our provincial supply mix until recent decades? Coal at its most basic is decayed plant matter, ancient, ancient decayed plant matter that's been uh, under pressure and is formed into a mass, a hard, typically black or brown mass. Uh, It's mostly carbon. Um, And it's been used until relatively recently because it's cheap and uh, often quite accessible. Unfortunately, it's still used in many parts of the world. It was used in Ontario to produce electricity till 2014. We'll have more chance to talk about that. But the short answer is that it was cheap. Uh, You could throw it into the furnace and burn it and um, it it, uh, created a lot of heat and uh, drove generators. There were lots of terrible problems with it, but it was accessible and cheap. Gideon, Some of us folks remember the days when acid rain and smog were a regular occurrence. Were these weather advisories a primary consequence of our coal usage? And if so, how? Also, what other impacts was it having on the environment and the health impacts on residents of Ontario? Yes, so certainly the coal plants were a big factor in smog and acid rain. Uh, They weren't the only factor, cars and trucks um, and other sources of uh, fossil fuel uh, combustion were also a problem, but the coal plants were a big problem. Excuse me. The coal plants in Ontario contributed, of course, and coal plants from other parts of North America, primarily the Midwestern US. They were big contributors to our acid rain and our smog. So that's, that was very much an issue. In terms of the impacts, um, the biggest impact that we talk about now is uh, the climate impact. Um, The the coal plants at their height were the equivalent of millions of cars on our roads. When we took the coal plants out, it was like removing six million cars from Ontario's roads. So they were a very, very significant source of greenhouse gases. And they also produced other things that were toxic, things like mercury, for example, and arsenic. Uh, So they were also a significant source of human health problems. Uh, they made uh, asthma worse, um, the, what they call the particulate matter um, in smog. Some of that came from coal plants and particulate matter is a factor in lung cancer. So a number of different ailments were connected to the coal plants. Now, in a nutshell, what was the case for eliminating coal fire electricity in Ontario and who led it? Also, Was there backlash in 2003 when Ontario announced it was closing the province's four remaining coal-fired plant? If so, what kind of backlash was there? Okay, that's a number of questions. So (laughs) So the case for closing the coal plants was that they were just a massive, massive source of greenhouse gas emissions and other contributors to, to pollution, uh, things like nitrous oxides and sulfur oxide, uh, sulfur dioxide. So they were contributing to climate change, they were contributing to acid rain, and they were contributing to human illness on a very big scale. And the other reason that it made sense to, to close them was that it was something doable. In Ontario, because they were publicly owned, there was an opportunity to do it in in quite a a, a rapid and efficient manner. You know, in many places, coal plants are privately owned, in the United States, for example. And so if they're privately owned, it's very difficult to close them quickly. There's all sorts of issues around compensation and government has to step in. It, It can be very complicated legally. But in Ontario, all the coal plants were owned by the government of Ontario. So the government of Ontario could close them basically through the stroke of a pen. And that's what happened. It was over a number of years, Um, but that's what happened. The Ontario government decided uh, that by 2014, there would no longer be coal used to produce electricity in the province. And that's what happened. So it was a matter of something that would have huge impact and that was doable. That was kind of the thinking behind it. 
In terms of backlash, there wasn't a lot of backlash. There were some who raised concerns about the transition, uh, loss of jobs for workers in the coal plants. There were some questions about electricity supply, but for the most part, um, I think there was a lot of public acceptance that we had to get off coal. This was something really good to do from an air quality point of view and increasingly from a climate change point of view. In terms of who drove the coal phase out, a lot of it was pushed by health professionals. The Ontario Medical Association, doctors, including some of the doctors that I work with in Physicians for the Environment, nurses, Ontario public health officials, um, medical officers of health, these sorts of people, and family physicians, these sorts of people saw firsthand the effect of smog, of bad air on people's lives. And they talked uh, openly about it. And so it was very much driven, I think, by the health professionals. I remember one time, Dan, <clears throat> when my uh, when I was working with the Physicians for Environment, we, we arranged a meeting to meet with the um, Minister of Environment for the province of Ontario. And I brought in uh, doctors, I brought in nurses, and we had an opportunity to talk across the table with the minister. And it was just fascinating for the minister to see firsthand the effect of coal on people's lives in a very direct way. I remember one of our doctors um, from Kingston, she said, you know, minister, there are times when the weather uh, when the air quality is so poor that my patients can't go outside and I really worry for them. And if you close the coal plants, this would make a huge difference in the lives of my patients. And you could see the minister really connecting with that at a very human level. Um, so it wasn't just an abstraction for, uh, for our doctors. And so I think that was one of the driving forces behind the coal plant phase out. I understand coal was reduced in stages between 2003 and 2014 to ensure system reliability. Gideon, do you know what were some of the challenges and where did they make up the shortfall in generation? Has it been renewable energy? Was it a smooth transition? What investments or strategies were put in place to make sure it succeeded? Yes, I think the short answer is that it was a smooth transition. I mean, it was over 11 years, so it wasn't like someone you know, uh, flipped a switch and it, it ended overnight. It was uh, carefully done, thoughtfully done over, an, over more than a decade. Um, um, I think that the, the ability of the province to move off coal was, um, was a fact was it was a function of a couple of things. So first of all, the doctors and the nurses, as I mentioned, I think prepared the public, explained the case for going off coal. So I think you had a public that was very supportive of the phase out of coal. I think that was one factor. The other factor is that while coal represented 25% of the electricity grid, it wasn't so massive an amount that it was impossible to do. I think it was it was a stretch, but it was something that was technically possible to do. It wasn't like we were having, it's not like our grid was 100% coal and we were trying to get off from 100% coal. It was 25%, Dan, and, and that's a very significant amount, but it was also doable. So I think that's important to say. The, the other piece is that they brought in, the Ontario government brought in some of the other um, parts of our electricity grid um, and ramped them up. So they refurbished the Bruce nuclear plants so that a couple of those uh, units came back and that was helpful in, in, the, in the transition. They put in some natural gas and that's problematic. We can talk about that in a little while, but, but they did ramp up natural gas, what they call peaker plants for the peak use of electricity. Uh, we did, they br did bring in a little bit more uh, hydro power and the biggest, uh, most, in, 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 and the biggest, or in terms of, in my view, the most exciting part of the transition was renewable energy. Um, and so there was quite an effort in those years from 2003 to 2014 to ramp up renewable energy, particularly wind and solar power. Wind and solar are still relatively small amounts of the, of the grid. In 2014, it was about 7% came from wind and solar. But that was also one of the things that allowed us to get off coal. So it was a combination of those things, some more nuclear, some, some renewables, and some natural gas, and also more of, a, of an emphasis on conservation so that we reduce demand. Let's move on to the next question. Decommissioning coal plants and investing in renewable energy comes at a cost. 
what kind of impact did this have on Ontario's electricity rates? According to the most recent comparison stats I have, Ontario's electricity rates are the fourth lowest in the country. In your mind, were fears justified or just overblown? Oh, yes, there was quite a bit of nonsense about how expensive, and I put that in quotation marks, renewables are. First of all, Dan, the cost of renewables has dropped dramatically. Between uh, 2012 and 2016 in Ontario, the, the cost of solar, for example, went down by about 50%. And this is part of a worldwide trend. And, and it's not just for me. I mean, don't take our word for it. If you look at the OECD um, statistics, uh, just in general, the cost of wind and solar have dropped very, very uh, precipitously, very sharp drop in the cost of wind and solar in particular. And it's not surprising. Once you put wind and solar in, once you put in the solar panels or build the, the windmills, the fuel, if you will, which is wind and sunlight, are free. So it's not so surprising that, you know, hello, renewables are, are not expensive. The other um, reason why we had such confidence in renewables in terms of cost <clears throat> was that some of the strongest economies in the world were embracing renewables. And I'm thinking, for example, of Germany. Germany's gone into renewables, much of it wind and solar, in a very big way, a very powerful industrial economy, and yet they've been able to make <clears throat> um, very significant advances in wind and solar, to the point where a very significant amount of their whole grid is now renewable. So we never had any concerns about the cost. Um, there's always some initial cost when you're moving to something new, but, but uh, those would be more than compensated for by just the fact that renewables were so inexpensive to run. So we were never concerned about that. The other side of the equation is that as we got off coal, we were also saving money. Don't forget there's a lot of costs, dollar costs in acid rain in destroying lakes, destroying our natural world. There's a lot of costs in harming people's health, right? If you've got thousands of people who have asthma that's gotten worse or other illnesses connected with uh, bad air, that's a cost as well. And of course, climate change is the perhaps the ultimate cost. So by phasing out coal fired power, we were saving money and by ramping up renewables, we were also saving money. So in terms of just dollars, yes, it made a lot of sense. Now, with the removal of coal from Ontario's supply mix, is gas next? What are some easy wins or long-term solutions that will take Ontario's or Canada's energy transformation to the next level? So one of the things, no question, that allowed us to get off coal was natural gas. And at the time, people saw natural gas as what we call kind of a transition fuel. You know, many in the environmental movement said it was a, a bridge. You know, we want to get to 100% renewables. We can't do that right away. So we need to move off coal, ramp up natural gas, at least in the short term. I think, unfortunately, now that <clears throat> that was probably a mistake to think that natural gas was a bridge. Natural gas is, is a fossil fuel, and although in some ways it's better than coal, um, it's still very problematic. Um, the production of natural gas, where you have what are called fugitive emissions, where um, uh, methane uh, uh, leaks when you uh, extract the natural gas, that's a big problem. And then, of course, when you burn the natural gas um, in a home or when you burn it at, a, at an electricity plant, um, you're producing greenhouse gases. So we have some real concerns about natural gas uh, electricity production. Where we need to be over time is renewables. I think the good news is that there's a lot of solar resource in, in Ontario. There's a lot of wind in Ontario. Um, we can probably get some more from, a little bit more from hydro, and that has to be done properly, but we can probably get a little bit more from Ontario uh, in terms of hydro. But I think one of the biggest things that we can draw on, Dan, to get to 100% renewables is getting wi uh, water power from other provinces. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about is buying more hydropower, water power, from Quebec. Quebec has a huge hydro resource, as you know, and uh, a lot of it's sold to American customers. Uh, that's understandable, but we could also buy much more of it here in Ontario. And so we think that a between a combination of more wind and solar and buying hydro from Quebec, Combined with more conservation, we really need to drive down our demand. We think between those factors, over time, we could have a 100% renewable grid. That's where we think we need to be. Gideon, wondering if you could share with us what are 
the biggest challenges or obstacles we are facing now in order to improve how we source energy in a post-coal energy world? What is needed to overcome these? Well, I think we probably have to stop calling natural gas natural gas. You know, the, the word <laughs> natural gas makes it sound like it's all just delightful, right? It's like organic, uh, organic fruits and vegetables. Natural gas is a fossil fuel, and uh, we have to remember that. And I think um, we have to um, put the climate crisis uh, front and center. And, and um, one of the things that's getting in the way of that is this belief that, you know, that natural gas is, uh, is, is reasonable, both for producing electricity and for heating our homes. We, we do, over time, have to move away from those things. Those are big challenges. We also have concerns with nuclear. I mean, um, there's concerns about cost. Uh, nuclear. Uh, it's getting increasingly expensive. There's concerns about what we do with the nuclear waste. I mean, uh, I don't know a community in Canada that particularly wants to house nuclear waste um, in its community. And I understand that, you know, we don't have a, a really long-term solid solution for nuclear waste anywhere on the planet that I'm aware of. So that's a very big concern. Uh, communities don't want that waste. Um, and even if we're able to store it for say a, a 500 years or a thousand years, some of that nuclear waste is uh, radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. So that's a big problem. So I don't think nuclear is a long-term solution as well. That's, that's our view. Uh, but there are some that think that. And so I think that that's another obstacle uh, that, we have to, that we have to confront as well. Those who think that nuclear is a climate solution. I, my own view is that it's not a long-term uh, uh, solution. The other piece that we have to remember around nuclear is that you have to mine for the uranium. The uranium that is used to fire the nuclear plant uh, comes out of the earth and um, you have to mine for it. And the mining of uranium is itself very carbon intensive. You have to use very heavy machinery that burns diesel fuel to get at that uranium. And so the claims that are made about nuclear being you know, completely clean and green, we believe are not accurate. So, but there is this belief that um, uh, nuclear is emissions free. And so I think that's one of the obstacles as well. Well, you've given us a picture of success in how we've managed to overcome these challenges of removing coal from our provincial supply mix. Ontario's electricity supply is expected to evolve over the next few decades as industry and consumers' needs change. Gideon, what do you think the future holds and what would you like to see? Well, I think the future really does um, does foresee much more in the way of renewables. I mean, what's really exciting about renewable energy is twofold in my view. First of all, we're seeing major economies. I mentioned Germany, but it's also places like Britain, Scandinavia, China. These large, large economies are increasingly powering themselves with renewables, much of it wind and solar. I'm not saying that they're at 100% yet, but it is astounding just how much of it is now powered by renewable energy. So that suggests to me that it's really practical for a country like ours, which has a relatively small population and a huge wind and solar resource to be able to power ourselves 100% renewable. I mean, I think, for example, on the prairies, Southern Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, it's just a world-class solar and wind resource. I mean, in, in, uh, in Saskatchewan, for example, Regina is the, is the sunniest capital in Canada. Saskatoon's motto is Saskatoon shines. Well, that's because there's an enormous amount of solar uh, power on those Southern Prairie uh, regions. And so that suggests to me that if we wanted to, we really could power most, if not all of our electricity needs with renewables. So that's one thing that's very encouraging to me and I'd like to see in the future. And the other piece is just the cost that, that, that as I mentioned, but I think it really is important to, to reiterate it, is that the cost is so favorable with renewable energy. So it's practical and it's something we can afford to do. Okay, Gideon, are you ready to close us off with some rapid fire questions? Okay. What is your favorite word? My favorite word is imagination and creativity. Sorry, two words, creativity and imagination. Now, what is the one thing you can't live without? I don't think I can live without my kids. What habit or hobby have you picked up during shelter in place? I do a lot more bike riding now, actually. Yeah, yeah. I used to be much of a, more of a walker, but now I'm a big cyclist. 
If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, just to be more chill, just to be a bit more calm. <laughs> I'd love to have the superpower just to be able to calm myself immediately. If you could turn back time and talk to your 18-year-old self, what would you tell him? Well, I think I'd probably say, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I'd probably say to my 18-year-old self, experiment a bit more, you know, um, try a few more things that are a bit out of your comfort zone. Yeah, I think I was a bit too cautious as a teenager. And lastly, what do you currently find most interesting in your sector? Well, the thing I find most interesting and also most exciting is the youth climate movement. The, the young people under um, Greta Thunberg um, and other young people, not just Greta, the Swedish young woman, but uh, the, the, um, the worldwide youth climate movement, young people saying we have to take action on climate change and getting out in the streets. Um, I found that really impressive and, and really moving. Well, Gideon, we've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Again, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a great chance to relive those uh, days of the coal phase out. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I truly hope you enjoyed this episode of the Think Energy podcast. For past episodes, make sure you visit our website, hydroottawa.com backslash podcasts. Lastly, if you found value in this podcast, be sure to subscribe. Anyway, this podcast is a wrap. Cheers, everyone.